Okay, y'all, I want to spend some time talking about underlay control planes in a data center fabric. I'm not going to spend any time going through overlay pro control planes yet. I have to develop that material in the future at some point, but for right now, we're going to spend a few of these sessions just looking at underlay control planes. I'm going to start someplace that might seem a little bit odd, so just bear with me for a minute. I want to begin by thinking about layers. Um, why are layers so important when we build a network? This is a traditional hierarchical design, right? I have an access layer, I have a distribution layer, and then I have my core. So I have a three layer design. And I have my workloads down here, down at the bottom of this. Now, of course, I can do a two layer design as well. I could do an aggregation and a core or I could do this all as the core and this is all the aggregation. Now what separates the things from each other, these layers from one another? Typically what separates these things is aggregation and summarization, right? That is what I use to break these layers apart is I'm aggregating and I'm summarizing. Another word for both of these is abstraction. So I'm abstracting information in some way. I'm actually removing information out of the system in order to break these layers apart. So what this is going to do is it's going to contain my failure domains in some way. By abstracting, by removing information out of the system, I'm managing my failure domains, or I'm managing the blast radius, as you might say. Some people like to say, I just like to call them failure domains, of each of these things. So if a link changes down here and aggregation is happening here, these core routers just don't need to know about that link failing, and that's perfectly fine. Now, in this style of network, I also have what I would consider to be modules, right? So this might be considered a module, and this might be considered a module. Now, I want these modules to be as repeatable as possible. And that's one of the key points. I only design a module once, and that saves me time. And it also helps me in troubleshooting because all my modules are very, very similar to each other. So I have these repeatable modules. And where the modules touch one another, these are what I would call interaction surfaces. Okay, that's, that's an actual term there that you would use for this. These are interaction surfaces. I can't spell, and nor can I write. Um, whenever I have to write something at a doctor's office or something, I take one of my daughters with me so they can write it with for me. They'll know what I'm going to do when they get married and move out because I'm not going to have anybody who can write in the house any longer. These modules can be seen as black boxes, right? So I have my three aggregation and my core and my two layer hierarchy. So this aggregation module is effectively a black box. I don't really necessarily need to know what's in there. I do need to know what's in there, but when I'm troubleshooting the whole system or I'm looking at the design of the whole system, I can treat it as like this one black box. Complexity is hidden within each block, but I also add complexity with these interaction surfaces as I build the network together. So I can think of another thing here. So I can think as I'm optimizing the network by reducing the state, I'm adding surfaces. This is how I can use my state optimization surface triangle or trade-off triad to think about these things and understand how they work. The aggregation that occurs in here reduces my state which is also going to decrease my optimization most of the time. Almost any time I remove state from a network, I'm going to reduce the optimization in some way. Generally, this is going to be something like, okay, I'm going to have suboptimal traffic flows or something like that. So what I want to do is I want to understand how to build these layers in a way that I logically break the network up so that I reduce complexity or I control complexity in the right places. If I build the system wrong and I layer in the wrong places, I actually increase complexity and I make the network harder to deal with. I'm going to give you another example of this kind of layering. This is the RINA model. The RINA model stands for the Recursive Internet Architecture. Uh, you can look this up. It's by John Day. There's a book about this. It's not really about this, but Patterns in Network Architecture, where he describes the RINA model. What I'm doing here is I'm thinking about how to layer my network transport. So I have uh, marshalling and multiplexing, error and flow control. And so I have one layer that has marshalling and multiplexing, and it has error and flow control. I have a second layer that has marshalling and multiplexing error and flow control. I have a third layer, and these are at different places. I have an interface to interface, which would be across Ethernet, host to host, which would be IP, 
and app to app, which would be perhaps HTML or something like that. So I have these modules. So this kind of suggests another way of layering for network design. What I can do is rather than simply layering hierarchically, I can actually layer vertically like I do with my transport system within each of these modules. So my aggregation layer, for instance, can have three layers or four layers or whatever within the aggregation layer. What's this going to do for me? First of all, it's going to allow me to build these modules larger and flatter because that allows me, by layering this way, I build my interaction surfaces vertically like this rather than horizontally along my hierarchical network topology. This allows me to control complexity within the aggregation layer. It's a layer within layer type of system. And you may have seen this with hierarchical networks that you can do a two layer within a two layer and give yourself kind of a layer within layer design. This is the same kind of concept, only I call these inside layers vertical layering. And I call the aggregation to core um, horizontal layering. It's just the way I talk about it because it allows me mentally to separate these two different concepts. So it allows me to control the complexity within a particular module and build a larger, flatter module. Now how does this apply to a data center fabric? If I think about a data center fabric, I can build the data center fabric with multiple layers, right? I can have different control planes at different layers. So I can have an underlay control plane, I can have an overlay control plane, and then I can have some sort of orchestration or controller or intent-based something or whatever, and I can keep building layers up here. I can have four layers, let's say, if I had an intent-based system. I can actually have an intent layer with a controller that implements the intent by managing the configurations of the overlay, and then the overlay is a separate layer than the underlay. And in between each of these, I'm going to have an interaction surface. Right? So what I'm doing is I'm going back to my state optimization surface trade-off situation here. And I'm saying that rather than breaking this network up horizontally to manage my complexity, I can break it up vertically within a horizontal module, within a hierarchical network design, and that allows me to build my modules larger and flatter. And it actually helps me manage my complexity in a different way. So let's spend some time talking about just this underlay right here and some of the control planes you can use for this underlay. So let's first start, talk about BGP because BGP is what most people tend to think of when they think of a data center fabric now. Now of course BGP wasn't designed to do data center fabrics, it was designed to do autonomous system interconnection. So it's basically a policy language laid on top of a loop-free routing algorithm. It's not even shortest path first, it's actually policy path first. Um, although there is a shortest path first kind of tiebreaker, but the AS path is really considered a tiebreaker in BGP. It's not considered a primary means of ensuring loop freeness of the path. And in fact, it's not the shortest path that you normally use. It's the one with no repeats in it. And you only, that's why it's called a tiebreaker, because it's actually, you're just using the repeats in the AS path to prevent the loops, and you're using the shortest path to find the optimal path in the case that there is no other policy that overrides the shortest path algorithm in, that's built into BGP, which is just the shortest path or the shortest AS path. So here is a chart that comes out of um, this link right here, and I'm not going to beat up too much on these things and who wrote them. I'm just going to say this is why a lot of people think about using BGP for the data center fabrics. So you look at this and it says prefix distribution. Well, yeah, OSPF and ISIS do that, and so does BGP, so they're equal. Prefix filtering. Well, OSPF and ISIS are sort of link state protocol, so you don't have a lot of filtering. And so BGP, because it's a path vector protocol, has very extensive filtering, uh, various types of policies. Now I'm going to point out that all three of these are policies. They're not shortest path first, they are policy. And that when you start implementing these kinds of policies, because BGP is primarily focused on a lot of policy, it's very useful to use the BGP in those cases. So traffic tagging. Uh, basic versus extensive, multi-vendor stability. Well, everybody implements BGP, right? And they all have good implementation. Uh, so you can find this in RFC 7938. You'll see exactly the same sort of concept. 
has a simple implementation and ease of operational support, minimize the failure domain. Uh, this is very good for a path vector protocol because path vectors aggregate or rather summarize topology information at every hop. So you're automatically doing some sort of modularization within the protocol itself. So what some people like to do is they like to do a single protocol fabric and use BGP both for the underlay and the overlay. So what they do is they will run IBGP to carry the underlay routes and eBGP to carry the overlay routes. This is kind of cool. You have one protocol that you're configuring and managing. It seems to make everything a lot simpler. You have one protocol to troubleshoot. You have the same policy instruments in both the overlay and the overlay for the most part. Things are slightly different in IBGP and then eBGP in terms of best path calculation, stuff like that. But you can work around all of that stuff. There are a couple of problems with using BGP as your underlay, however. First, BGP convergence very, very slowly. I'm going to spend time in another video talking about BGP convergence in more depth, or maybe the same depth, I'm not really sure yet. But I'll just run through it real fast. If I inject 110 colon colon slash 64, and all of these routers are running, BGP speakers are running eBGP, and I have no other policies configured in this network, what's going to happen is P is going to choose the path to use based on just the AS path link, because that's the tiebreaker that's going to fall into place. So I inject 110 colon colon slash 64. P now has, after everything converges or whatever, P now has four paths, one through G, one through M, one through K, and one through N, right? So let's say that this link between A and 110 colon colon slash 64 falls off the network, fails. So this, this particular destination just falls off the network. At T1, A is going to advertise a withdraw to G, B, C, and D, right? So this is my T1. Now, G, B, C, and D are going to recalculate their best path in BGP. And at T2, G is going to advertise a withdraw to P. B is going to advertise a withdraw to M, C is going to advertise a withdrawal to F, and D is going to withdraw, advertise a withdrawal to E, right? Now P is going to receive the withdrawal from G and say, what do I do about this? I've lost my best path. So it's going to flip to its next best path, which is going to be through M, because that's the next shortest AS path. Now at T3, M is going to advertise the withdrawal, and F is going to advertise a withdrawal, and E is going to advertise a withdrawal. P is going to receive the withdrawal from M and go, wait, what do I do now? So it's going to flip over to using K as its best path. At T4, K advertises the withdrawal. H advertises the withdrawal to N. P receives the withdrawal from K and says, what do I do? It flips to its next best path, which is through N. At T5, N now advertises the withdrawal. P realizes it has no route. Now, the question is, how long does each of these T's that I'm talking about, T1, T1, T2, T3, etc. take. It takes exactly min route advertisement interval. So your min route advertisement interval manages or controls the convergence of BGP in a network with multiple paths with high ECMP. So if I look at something like even this small butterfly fabric and I start thinking about if I would draw a route from up here I have to not only go through this five-stage fabric, but I have all of my reflected paths and my multi-hop paths that flow through this network that are longer potential paths. This really slows BGP down in convergence. It's very, very difficult to make BGP converge in this kind of environment. So what can you do? What you can do is you can, first of all, prevent these top-of-rack switches from reflecting withdrawals and advertisements back up. They shouldn't be transits anyway, right? They should just not even be transiting traffic at all in BGP terms. So what you can do is go out here and configure a filter, which is dollar sign caret, which just says only advertise things that have an empty AS path. Now it's important to remember that BGP adds its local AS number after it's advertised something, not before. So therefore, what you're getting to is you're actually telling this top of rack switch, if you receive a route from an upstream router, don't re-advertise it. So that's one thing you can do. A second thing you can do is you can place all of the routers in this spine in the same AS. If you do that, 
then when the route is withdrawn this direction or advertised in this direction, what's going to happen is, is it's not going to re-advertise back up because you're learning it from the same AS. So you can do a lot of things to make BGP converge faster. Now I will tell you that as you're doing these things, what you're doing is you're converting BGP into a very fancy RIP, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with this. Uh, it's a perfectly valid thing to do if you want to make BGP converge faster to use it as your underlay protocol. I'm going to talk about some other alternative solutions here, however, that might be useful. Another thing to think about when you're using BGP as your underlay is you have to somehow compute your router ID and AS number or configure them. You've got to peer on link locals or set up configuring manually or through your automation system. You've got to be able to auto discover local peers. There's been lots of proposals in the ITF on how to fix this. You've got to peer with anybody who tries to open. Now I'll just tell you, this is an open area where an attacker, if they can get into your network, could peer with one of your BGP routers because you have open peering configured. So this is an attack service that you're opening here. You have to use something like BGPLS to gather your topology. If you're going to have a controller that does any sort of traffic steering, you've got to have the topology view of the network. So this is all a lot of work to do. So what we're going to do is instead we're going to think about some other options. I want to say one other thing though before I move on to the next session. And this is getting a little bit long, but still I want to point out that if I'm using BGP for my underlay and my overlay, I do not have clean separation between my vertical layering. And I'm building that vertical layering in the same way that I do horizontal layering in order to control complexity and make my network scale better. So these types of things are what I'm going to run into. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about link state, and we'll just say that for right now that link state converges faster and provides better visibility in the network. So we'll talk in the next little section about the concept link state as your underlay rather than BGP.